In this presentation, we're going to talk about single crystal x-ray diffraction. This video is broken down into five separate parts. The history, the properties and instruments that are important to XRD, the methods, the experimental procedure to perform single crystal XRD, and recent developments in the field. And we'll start by going over a brief history of x-ray diffraction. X-rays were discovered in 1895 by German physicist Wilhelm Conrad Rankin. Rankin was testing cathode rays and if these rays could pass through glass. While testing, he noticed a nearby chemically coated screen was glowing. Rankin experimented it in his lab, learning that X-rays can pass through low-density substances like human tissue, but they do not pass through high de higher-density substances like bone. However, it was not until 1912 until the exact nature of x-rays was understood. In 1912, x-ray diffraction was discovered by Max von Lau. He found that the crystalline substances act as a diffraction grating in three dimensions for x-rays, with wavelengths comparable to the spacing of the crystallographic planes in the lattice. He did the first diffraction experiment on copper sulfate. Now let's briefly go over x-rays and how they are produced. X-rays are electromagnetic waves, just like normal visible light rays, but at wavelengths around 1,000 times shorter. And they can be produced through a variety of means, but the most common of which for our application is the cathode ray tube. A vacuum tube uses a high voltage across a cathode and an anode. Electrons leave the cathode and collide with the anode. This collision produces x-rays, the spectrum of which depends on the anode material and the accelerating voltage used across the cathode and the anode. Now let's talk about how x-rays are actually detected. Photographic film served as the detector in earlier methods. The positions of the diffraction points or the lines correspond to individual Bragg angles. But nowadays, usually a radiation counter is used as a detector. A scintillation counter is a common radiation detector that works by using the excitation effect of incident radiation on a material in the scintillator, which produces a pulse of photons, which are then detected by a photodetector. The pulse of photons is converted into an electrical signal, which can be processed by a computer. Compared to film, a scintillation counter can measure diffraction intensities and Bragg angles much more accurately and it is very convenient to use in combination with computers to analyze the data. Next we'll go over some of the different methods of x-ray diffraction. Single crystal x-ray diffraction is similar to all other kinds of x-ray diffraction in that incident x-rays interact with the sample to produce constructive interference with the diffracted rays uh, when the conditions of these rays satisfy Bragg's law. Powder XRD is a technique primarily used for the phase identification of a crystalline material, and it can provide information on the unit cell dimensions as well. Single crystal XRD is a technique which provides detailed information about the internal lattice of crystalline substances, uh, including the unit cell dimensions, the bond angles and lengths, and the details of the site ordering. From a single crystal XRD test, the data can be an analyzed and interpolated to obtain the crystal structure. Single crystal XRD requires that the sample contain one large crystal grain, while powdered XRD requires that the sample have many small crystal grains that are randomly oriented in a powder. This difference in sample preparation means that the single crystal XRD diffraction conditions are met at points in the 3D reciprocal space. Whereas in powder XRD, the diffraction conditions are met at spheres in the 3D reciprocal space. Therefore, the data from single crystal XRD is distributed in three dimensions. However, the data from powder XRD is compressed into one single dimension which is why we were able to extract more useful information on the crystal structure from single crystal XRD. The most common methods of performing single crystal XRD are the Lau method and the rotating crystal method. 
An additional third method, the four circle diffractometer method, will be talked about as well. In the Lau method, the crystal is held stationary on the sample holder, therefore there is a fixed angle of incidence. The sample is hit by a continuous spectrum X-ray beam, therefore the wavelength varies. This is usually used to determine the crystal orientation, not the crystal structure. Although the Lau method can be used to determine the crystal structure, several wavelengths can reflect in different orders from the same set of planes, with different order reflections then superimposed on the same spot on the film. So this makes the determination of the crystal structure by each spot intensely difficult. There are two subcategories of the Lau method. There's the back reflection method and the transmission method. In the back reflection method, the film is placed between the x-ray source and the crystal. The beams which are diffracted in a backward direction are then recorded by the detector. One side of the cone of Lau reflections is defined by the reflected beam. The film intersects the cone with the diffraction spots, generally lying on a hyperbola. The image shown here is an example of a back reflection film from sodium chloride. In the transmission Lau method, the film is placed behind the crystal to record the beams which are transmitted through the crystal. Like in back reflection, the film intersects the cone of Lau reflections however with the diffraction points generally lying on an ellipse. The image shown here is an example of a transmission film, also of sodium chloride. In the rotating crystal method, the crystal is mounted to the sample holder and rotated normal to a monochromatic x-ray beam. The film is placed around the crystal in a cylinder as the crystal rotates, eventually the incident x-rays will produce the correct Bragg angle, and a diffracted beam will be formed, making a point on the film. The four-circle diffractometer method is a cross between the Lau and the rotating crystal method. Uh, it may not really deserve its own category, but it's interesting, so let's talk about it. In this method, the crystal is held stationary on the sample holder. However, the angles that relate the crystal lattice, the incident x-rays, and the detector can be varied. So this has a fixed and a varying angle of incidence. The crystal is hit by a monochromatic spectrum x-ray beam, uh, so the wavelength is fixed. In this method, because we are using an x-ray counter instead of a film, the reflections are detected one at a time. So we have to know where the reflections will occur in order to set the four angles prior to the test. As mentioned earlier, a scintillation counter is a common example for a detector that is used in this setup. Now we'll go over the basic procedure for performing a single crystal XRD experiment. The experimental setup to perform single crystal XRD consists of three basic elements. Your producer of the X-rays, your sample holder and your sample, as well as an X-ray detector. We must have a single stable sample generally between 50 and 250 microns in size. Ideally, the sample should be between 150 and 250 microns in size. The sample should be of one single uniform grain with the least amount of defects possible. Sample holders are chosen to support the crystal while also minimizing the absorption by the holder. A common practice is to mount the sample on top of a thin, t thin glass fiber using an adhesive. After centering the crystal, the first step in running an experiment is often to perform a preliminary scan. This scan is used to determine the quality of the sample. If the crystal sample is poor, it is better to find out now than after the test, which could take up to a few days. A preliminary scan can produce a set of frames, which is used to determine the Bravis lattice and the crystal system, which gives us the orientation and the refined cell data needed before any intensity data can be collected. Once these setup steps are completed, a test can be started to record the intensity data. Depending on what type of test is being run, this can take anywhere from a few hours to a few days. Once a test is complete, corrections must be applied to the data to account for instrumental factors, 
polarization effects, x-ray absorption effects, and potentially the crystal decomposition. Each set of planes can be combined with the structure factors of the specific crystal system to give us the electron density and therefore the crystal structure. This is done by solving the phase problem. From the phase problem, the elements making up the crystal can be assigned based on the measured intensity values. Generally, heavier elements have larger intensity values. Lastly, the observed and calculated crystal structures can be compared. The result of the structure refinement process provides us the locations of each atom in a unit cell as XYZ assignments and the distance between each nearest atomic neighbor. The quality of a solution is assessed by the values of R1, WR2, and GOOF. R1 is called the R value, and this is the agreement between the observed and the calculated models. So ideal solutions would have a R value of zero, but due to errors within the system and the experimental process, an R value of zero is never actually achieved. R values are listed as percents, and an R value of less than 5% is usually considered a good solution, while very high quality samples and testings will result in an R value of lower than 2.5%. WR2 is similar to R1, but it is instead associated with the square of the structure factors. Therefore, WR2 will always have a larger value than R1. The final value, GOOF, refers to the goodness of fit of the solution. This is associated with the difference in the structure values, as well as the number of observed reflections and the parameters used during the experiment. The goodness of fit should approach one after the structure refinement process. Now we'll talk about an important recent development in the field of single crystal X-ray diffraction. Traditional XRD is not a time-dependent process, meaning that in general, the structure of the crystal does not change over the course of the test. However, time-resolved single crystal X-ray diffraction can provide the crystal structure of a specimen over a period of time, and this is useful because we can observe solid state reactions in situ and identify transient or intermediate structures that are only formed during the reaction process. This means that the 3D structures of all the reactants and products and the short-lived intermediates can be determined at a very high resolution. A common method of time-resolved single crystal X-ray diffraction is called the pump probe method. The following video is provided by Quantum Made Simple and will help explain the pump probe technique. Here a reaction is triggered by photo excitation during the pump process. This is done by quickly hitting the sample with electromagnetic radiation generated by a laser, exciting the atoms of the substance by the absorption of the photons. Then incident x-rays strike the sample during the probe process at a specific time delay after the pump. A diffraction pattern is collected by the probe process and the cycle is repeated. The data from these tests can then be analyzed and configured to play back as a solid state reaction occurring in real time. One application of the pump probe method is in solid state photochemical reactions. A regular repeating cycle is set up during which the crystal is excited by a short light pulse and is then allowed to return to the ground state during a decay period before the next pulse. A measurement is synchronized to the pump pulse such that the data is collected after a fixed time delay. The short pump pulse generates a small excited state population and the following probe measures the population over a short time period in line with the target time resolution. Repeating this cycle with varying time delays allows a wide range of light activated solid state reactions to be observed and characterized that would not be accessible without this technology as in the example of the isomer shown on the right hand side of this slide. Time resolved single crystal x-ray diffraction has many applications in not only the field of material science but also in electrical, biomedical, chemical and many other disciplines. Additionally other technologies are directly Im impacting the field of XRD as the instruments we use today are constantly being improved. Time resolved single crystal XRD is only possible due to recent developments in x-ray sources and the detectors. So as the technology we use to perform these tests gets better, 
we'll likely dis discover more uses and applications that we can't even imagine right now. So thank you for watching. Uh, I hope this was enjoyable and informative.